Now, the topic which I have this afternoon is particularly focused on one aspect of MMT. MMT is, as its fuller name implies, from K4, hence 4Q MMT, and MMT is an acronym for three key words in the text, Miktsat Ma'aseh HaTorah, a selection of works of the law, or some of the works of the law. And that phrase has been pulled out by the editors as the characteristic phrase which tells you something at least of what this text is all about. So whereas many of the Qumran scrolls simply have uh, the cave number, then the letter Q, and then a number, 4Q375 or whatever, this one is glorified with this particular uh, 4Q MMT. It is in fact a reconstruction construction from six Qumran fragments, none of them complete in themselves, that is 4Q numbers 394 to 399, and it seems to be a letter written roughly in the 2nd century BCE, mid-2nd century as far as we know, from a leader in the group at Qumran to the head of a larger group of which the Qumran sect may have once been a part. If you're not familiar with the text, you can find it in what are the now standard translations, whether it's Geza Vermesh or Wise, Abeg and Cook or Garcia Martinez. Those are the three that I routinely now use, but as you will know, there are new editions coming out. There are new translations and new editions of translations coming out all the time. It's a growth industry. And uh, the thing about 4Q MMT is that of course there has been a non-academic controversy about who owned the text and the copyright on it which members of the B Biblical Archaeology Society will not need reminding about but as far as I can see concentration on that issue has sometimes obscured what is from my point of view a far more interesting issue as to what the text actually says particularly right at the end of it and I'm going to put up on an overhead projector, if I can walk over here without losing contact with my own sound system, um, uh, a little bit from the very end of the text. Again, if I can make this work, and my, my deep gratitude to those who provided me with an acetate and pencils at the last minute. I had hoped to have printed this out for you, only to discover that my hotel business center was not working on a Saturday and hence couldn't do it. I hope that is more or less legible. I shall read it to you in case it isn't, and then at least you will know what the squiggles on the page have to say. This is the conclusion of the whole text. We have written to you some of the works of the law, or a selection of works of the law, those which we determined would be beneficial for you and for your people. There then follows a few more lines, which I will just read. Because we have seen that you possess insight and knowledge of the law, understand all these things and beseech him, that is, beseech God, to set your counsel straight and so keep you away from evil thoughts and the counsel of Belial. And then we pick up on this text again. Then you shall rejoice at the end of time or the end time or the end of the times when you find the essence of our words to be true or again, this selection of our words to be true. And then the bit which sends shivers down the spine of a Pauline scholar, it will be reckoned to you as righteousness, in that you have done what is right and good before him, that is before God, to your own benefit and to that of Israel. It will be reckoned to you as righteousness. Now, students of Qumran among you will know that there are other Qumran texts in which the language of righteousness and justification feature prominently. 1QS, one of the very earliest scrolls to emerge, had a, a one, has a wonderful poem at the end. As for me, my justification is with God. In his hand are the perfection of my way. He will wipe out my transgression through his righteousness, and so on and so on. And people have often said, hey, there we've got some stuff that's rather like Paul, and people have now said that about this text as well. But in what way is it like Paul? Paul? That's the question that I'm going to be considering with you this afternoon. And from it, there emerge, I hope, some making more precise of what Paul was meaning and of what this text was meaning as well.
Because, you see, many scholars have simply observed, Paul says justification by faith, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Qumran says, do these works of the law and that will be reckoned to you as righteousness. And so the two or three scholars who have written about this problem already, including James Dunn and Martin Abegg uh, and Michael Bachmann in Germany, have said more or less it looks as though MMT is commending that which Paul is condemning. MMT is saying you should be justified by the works of the law. Paul is saying no, you shouldn't. You should be justified by faith. Now, there are all sorts of other preliminary matters which I might go into, but I'm not going to because of time. I want to focus on the central issue. But just to note that, of course, the reconstruction of the text and its translation are inevitably slightly controversial from point to point. I'm not going to go into those things in any detail unless you specifically ask me to, and then I shall probably say that I don't know the answer. Uh, what I want to do instead is to propose six propositions to you, which I shall put up on another acetate so that you can see them, and then I shall work through them one by one. I know that sometimes when people put up acetates with six things on, they cover them up and tease you with wondering what the next one is going to be. And teachers among you have probably been taught that that is good pedagogic method. I'm just going to give you the six and then... Uh, you can look at them to your heart's content and amuse yourself by puzzling out what this shorthand actually means. The first point is, can you see those all right? Is, is everyone reasonably happy with the visibility, if not the comprehensibility of it? The first one is that the context of the whole thing in 4QMMT is covenantal and eschatological. What do I mean by that? And how does this relate to Paul? Well, the writer has in mind an eschatological scheme based in Scripture within which the covenant between God and Israel is even now, we're talking mid-2nd century BCE, even now in process of renewal. And this business about being reckoned as righteousness and the business about the works form part of this scheme. This is extremely important. I don't think anyone has yet pulled this out of the text, though it sits there. In the fragmentary section labeled C6 to 9, I should have said, and I'm sorry I didn't, that MMT is divided into A, B, and C by modern scholars, and the bit that we're looking at comes in C, the third section. In the fragmentary section C6 to 9, the writer reminds his readers that we, presumably his own group and in some way that of his readers, they seem to have some commonality, that we have separated ourselves from the multitude of the people and from their impure practices. Precisely who they were historically and why the separation took place is of course much debated as you may know. But that doesn't affect my present argument. In any case, the group seems to be some kind of a sect, that is a community within Israel who believe themselves to be the true Israel, the covenant people of the one God. The writer then repeats in C10 an earlier exhortation that they should study the scriptures and proceeds to focus upon one rather clear and sharp bit of scripture in particular, namely the end of Deuteronomy. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapters 30 and 31, which as you will know are all about the blessings and the cursings of the covenant that will come upon those who keep or those who reject the Torah. But these passages he does not merely see as covenantal in the sense of sitting at the beginning of the covenant so that anyone can relate to them how she or he wants. They are also to be read, he says, as we would say, eschatologically. That is, of course, our shorthand for what he is saying. What do I mean by that? I mean that they do not merely, these passages in Deuteronomy 30 and 31, they do not merely hold out a timeless blessing and a timeless curse. They are not merely an abstract system into which anyone could plug anywhere, anytime. They offer rather a historical sequence which Israel as a nation will follow through, pulling down the curses on herself and then at the end of the days, discovering, after all, the way to blessing. In other words, Deuteronomy 
is covenantal. It's saying, here's the covenant, keep it and you'll live, don't and you'll get the curse. But it says, and then what will happen is that you will keep it for a while and you'll get the blessing. Then you won't keep it for a long while and you'll get the cursing. And then at the end of the days, it will all come right again and you will get a new blessing. So in section C lines 12 to 16, I appreciate you don't have the text in front of you, but if you take this down, then when you do scurry back home to your translation or your edition of Qumran, you can look it up. In C 12 to 16, the text quotes from Deuteronomy 31, 29, 31, 29, and Deuteronomy 31 and 2, 31 and 2, to establish this particular prophetic sequence. Israel, after an original blessing, will turn from the path and evil will befall her. Then in the last days, in the last days, she will return to her God with all her heart and all her soul and will find life. The last days, in the ends of the days. That's in C14 and again and again. And in our passage in C30 and 31, it's at the end of the time. And uh, th these seem to be more or less synonymous. There will come a great end time when this will happen. Now, interestingly, before the turning from the path, there will be an initial time of blessing, says the text. And the text in C17 cites King Solomon, not as a miscellaneous example of somebody who happened to keep Torah and so to find the pro promised blessing, but as the king in whose days the promised initial blessing was fulfilled. But then it says, after Solomon, of course, came Jeroboam, the king of Israel, and from his days onwards, says our text, section C, lines 18 to 20, from Jeroboam's days onwards, the curses have come upon Israel as a result. The climax of the curse is exile, which is mentioned explicitly in C19 in connection with Zedekiah. So the, the, the story of Israel is told in terms of Deuteronomy, Solomon, Jeroboam, Zedekiah, exile, and now us. And the writer draws these lessons. In C20, he says, well, the promised blessing and curse have already come upon Israel, so it's now nearly the time for Deuteronomy 30, one and following, to be fulfilled. When these things come to pass, then the fulfillment will occur. And also he says in C21 and following that what is now to happen is the return from exile. This is a feature of various people's work at the moment, including my own, which some New Testament scholars seem to find it very difficult to get their heads round that most Jews in the 3rd and 2nd century and even the 1st century BCE did not believe that the exile was really over. They had come back geographically but the period that they called exile was the period when Israel was being ruled over by pagans and that still hadn't ended yet. So the writer locates his own intended position within a covenantal and eschatological scheme. Deuteronomic promises, blessings under Solomon, curse ending and concluding with exile and now the return from exile which is now actually taking place in and for this sect. And the exhortation is thus aimed at persuading the readers to join those who are in the present time turning to God with all their heart and soul and so experiencing this real uh, return from exile. A, bl a blessing which was that anticipated by not only Solomon but also David. David is quoted C23 uh, so, sorry, C25 and 26 as being somebody who got the blessings of old and now we're getting back to that sort of a period. Now, within this covenantal and eschatological scheme, the writer intends his readers to hold fast to these particular precepts of Torah according to this particular interpretation. An interpretation which has gone on through sections A and B of the letter, which I haven't had time to expound to you, but which have to do with a lot of detailed commandments, not merely repetition of biblical commandments, but interpretation as to how you are to keep certain purity laws, how the purity of streams of liquid works, uh, the fact that the blind and the lame are to be excluded from the temple, and various other specific rules. And the point is this, 
He is not advocating a theologically or historically isolated moralism. He's not saying this is how to behave yourself if you want to earn God's favor. He's saying these are the works of Torah which will mark you out in the present time as the true returned from exile covenant people of Israel. And the key line is the one which I had on the, on the screen a minute ago, C30 and C31. If you keep these precepts, you will rejoice at the end of time in finding that the advice was on the right track. Because then, C31, it will be reckoned to you as righteousness when you perform what is right and good before God. In other words, the practice of these commands of Torah in the present time, according to the interpretation of the writer, will mark the practitioners out in advance as righteous, the people with whom Israel's God is in covenant, the people who, like David, have their sins forgiven. And if you want to know what MMT says on the subject which we might call justification, not that it uses the word justification, this, I think, would be it. Now, that's my first point then, and in some ways the longest and most substantial. I haven't actually measured them in length, but that's quite a full one. That the context of what MMT has to say about being reckoned, these works being reckoned as righteous, righteousness is covenantal and eschatological, looking back to Deuteronomy and to its supposed prophetic scheme. Now, the second point. How does MMT then relate initially to Paul? And my basic point is that for MMT, the halakha, the specific commands in MMT, which we haven't looked at, but you can go and look them up easy enough, they function as boundary markers indicating in the present those who will be vindicated in the future. And as you'll see in number three, for Paul, we have a very similar scheme, but with faith in place of works. Now here it's tricky for those of us who are educated in seminaries or schools of Christian theology or New Testament, because the word justification, which I've already used today, actually means something rather different for those schooled in post-Reformation dogmatics from the way in which it appears in Second Temple Judaism. This is a problem which I and other theologians have to face. Hopefully it needn't trouble us this afternoon, except that for any of you who come out of that context, you may otherwise be a little puzzled by what I'm saying. The halakhic precepts offered in the text are intended when put into practice to function as indicators and boundary markers of the true Israel. In other words, observing these works of the law isn't how you become a member of the true Israel. It's how you are marked out as a member. Of course, if you hadn't been practicing them before, the fact that you'd started doing so might mark an entry, a beginning, but that's not the point of this section. In the terminology made famous by E.P. Sanders in his book, Paul and Palestinian Judaism, 21 years ago, the works of the Torah here are about staying in the covenant or being marked out as a member of the covenant, not about getting in to start off with. MMT, in other words, provides a further example of what Sanders meant by covenantal gnomism. Works of the law function within the broader covenantal and eschatological scheme which has been set out. They can't be abstracted from it into either a more generalized system of timeless halakha, such as you find in the Mishnah, for instance, or into a generalized legalism to which Paul's doctrine of justification could then be opposed. So the works commended in MMT are designed to mark out the true Israel in the present time, the time when the final fulfillment of Deuteronomy has begun but not yet been completed. They are designed so that you may rejoice at the end of time, discovering that what's going on in the present, the essence of our words now, is true. They enable the sect, in other words, to anticipate the verdict of the last day, when it will be seen that those who follow this particular halakha are indeed the true renewed Israel. This then is the role of the works which MMT commends. What then about Paul? Point three. Paul, I propose, held, despite what a lot of Pauline writers would have you think, 
Paul held a version of the same covenantal and eschatological scheme of thought. But in his scheme, the place taken by works of Torah in MMT, namely that which defines and marks out the eschatological people of God, was taken by faith. Now, both halves of this comparison need far fuller explanation than there is time for this afternoon. I have written on this, uh, on the Pauline end of this elsewhere, both in my book, The Climax of the Covenant, and in my book, which has the rather strange title chosen by the publishers, not by me, of What St. Paul Really Said, a very pretentious title, which I hope to change in the second edition. Like the author of MMT and the Qumran writers in general, and for that matter much of Second Temple Judaism, Paul believed that he and his compatriots were living not as historically isolated individuals, attempting as individuals to enter into or sustain a relationship with God, but as Jews within a continuing saga of prophesied history. They were part of a story, part of a drama, which was the great drama of covenantal promise and fulfillment, and more particularly in his day of exile and restoration. Now, I've already said something about that being contentious. I see in my notes something more about that being contentious, so I won't labor the point, but I, I believe it to be demonstrable again and again that many or most Second Temple Jews thought the exile was still continuing, that is, the period of covenantal curse was still going on and they were waiting for the real return from exile. And the perspective of MMT is exactly that of the Damascus document, one of the best known of the scrolls, CD1 lines 5, 6, 7 and 8, which say that the emerging sect is, as it were, the advance guard of the real return from exile. The return has begun secretly with them. It's a bit of inaugurated eschatology. It, it hasn't been completed yet, but it certainly has begun. And so the language and concept of exile function as a theological metaphor to denote a continuing socio-political reality and to invest that with its theological and covenantal significance. For the Qumran community, the story of God and Israel had reached its turning point with the work of the teacher of righteousness. But for Paul, the covenantal story of God and Israel had reached its climax with the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, whom Paul believed to be Israel's Messiah. For Paul, with Jesus, the new age had dawned. This was the time when the promises were to be fulfilled not in the way that he, the pre-Christian Saul of Tarsus, had anticipated. There was a great deal of redefinition, but there was also a great strong sense of fulfillment. Uh, since the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, had been raised from the dead, he had inaugurated the new age. It was not yet concluded. Paul is very keen on the not yet as well as on the now, but there was a now, there was a present tense of eschatological fulfillment, even though the last days were still to come when the final visible judgment would take place. All of this is well known in Paul, for instance, that last bit in Romans chapter 2 and elsewhere. But Paul then goes on in Romans chapter 3 to declare that the verdict of the last day could be brought forward into the present. You can see in the present what it's going to be like in the future. And the sign which will mark out in the present those who are to be vindicated in the future judgment is nothing more nor less for Paul than faith. Faith in the God who made the promises to Abraham, faith in the God who made the promises that we find in Deuteronomy. And this is, of course, the context within which Paul uses himself the phrase quoted in MMT C31, which we had at the beginning, it is reckoned to you as righteousness. Paul in Romans 4 quotes from Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and that was reckoned to him as righteousness, Romans 4 verse 3. And he repeats that several times in that same chapter, Romans 4. Indeed, it's the main theme of the entire passage. Similar things could be said about the quotation of the same line in Galatians chapter 3. Paul's view, it seems, is that when people believe in the gospel of the Messiah, Jesus, there they are assured in the present 
of membership in the covenant family which God promised to Abraham. The verdict of the last day, God's vindication of Israel, has been brought forward into the present in their case. Let me sketch this out in a diagram for you. I shall put this numbered acetate back on in a minute, but this diagram will, I hope, make it clear. Uh, I appreciate there's rather a lot of arrows running around. Let me just talk you through it. The teacher of righteousness up at the top was the cause of the community being established, the Qumran community. That, of course, is cutting a lot of historical stories very short, as those of you who've specialized in this will know. But basically, the community has been established. Then the arrow which goes out to the left shows that that community are looking back, as in this text, to Deuteronomy. They look back to lots of other stuff as well, of course. But here they are looking back to Deuteronomy as the covenantal promise. And the arrow that comes down then says that they have gone through the time of exile to their present establishment. Then out to the right, they are looking on to final vindication, the time when God is still going to act up there in the future, in the last days or at the end of the days. And then the key bit, they are marked out in the present by the works of Torah. These, this bit here is the key bit. They are marked out in the present by works of Torah, which anticipates what will be true of them in the future. Now my basic case to you at this point is that Paul holds a very similar scheme. Let me bring that up so that people can see it. Through Jesus, the crucified Messiah, the community has been established, which looks back to Abraham and Deuteronomy, which has come through the exile, and which looks on to final vindication Paul's still future eschatology, what will happen at the end of the days when people will be raised from the dead, and they are marked out in the present, and this is the key thing, not by a selection of works of Torah or by any such thing, but rather by faith. And this is the point of what is called justification by faith in Paul, that what happens in Paul is that people are at present marked out by faith, which anticipates God's verdict in the future. One of the many reasons why I find MMT exciting is, in fact, that I think you have here as clear a view as anywhere in any Jewish text that I know of that uh, scheme which Paul then develops and adapts in his own particular context and setting. Uh, I can put that diagram up again later if you want, but I want to go back on with the numbered sequence. Let me just develop three a little bit more about this same scheme. Notice that for Paul, the scheme is, as MMT is, covenantal and eschatological. Justification is God's verdict, the verdict of the last day brought forward into the present. Now. In Romans chapter 10, Paul makes use of exactly the same passage of Old Testament scripture, Hebrew scripture, as uh, MMT did, namely Deuteronomy 30 and so on. The key passage is Romans 10 verses 5 through 10, where he says, Moses writes of the righteousness of the law that the one who does them shall live in them. That's from Leviticus. But then he uses Deuteronomy to expound Leviticus. What does this doing of the law actually mean? And he says, well, according to Deuteronomy, the righteousness of faith says, don't say in your heart who will go up into heaven. And the Deuteronomy text goes on to bring the law down for us so that we may do it. Or who will go across the sea to bring the law near us so that we may do it. The word is near you on your lips and in your heart so that you may do it. This is the logic of what Paul is saying that the Deuteronomy 30 fulfillment of the law is something which is the real doing of the law which happens in the eschaton, in the last days. But Paul develops it differently. He says, do not say in your heart who will go up into heaven, that is to bring the Messiah down, the Messiah taking the place of the law, or who will grow, go across the great deep to bring the Messiah up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your mouth, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. 
The point that Paul is making is that that same passage of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, is now fulfilled when people believe in Jesus as Messiah. Paul, like Qumran, is living within a great controlling narrative, the covenantal and eschatological narrative which Deuteronomy has marked out in chapters 30 and 31 and 32. Now, the details of how Paul arrives at this exegesis are not my present concern. I am supposed to be writing a commentary on Romans, which is only two years late for publication, and I'm a little embarrassed about that. Um, but uh, I'm, So I should know about that stuff, but I'm not going to talk about why he does this. My point is simply here that Romans 10, like MMT uh, part C, reads Deuteronomy 30 as a promise about the real return from exile to be accomplished in the writer's own day at the end of this period of curse, the curse of exile. But whereas for MMT, the sign of such a returned community was obedience to specific precepts of extra-biblical Torah, for Paul, the sign was faith in Jesus the Messiah as the risen Lord. And the immediate corollary is, of course, that whereas for MMT the precepts of Torah meant drawing carefully and tightly the boundary lines between Israel and the Gentiles, and then more boundary lines between the true Jews and all the rest of those Jews who didn't follow these particular precepts, for Paul, this faith means that the thing is thrown open to all, Jew and Gentile alike. Anyone who wants can come in and believe in Jesus as Messiah. So Paul's theology, like that of MMT, is covenantal and eschatological, but within the form, there is radical new content. Now, there's a final point in which the parallel between MMT and Paul needs to be nuanced and modified. This is all still under number three here. MMT presupposed obedience to the biblical Torah and added extra commands as a further interpretation of how precisely one should keep the biblical Torah. But Paul, by placing Christ's faith at the crucial point of community definition, clearly intends that neither possession nor practice of either Torah itself or particular sectarian halakot would be of any importance in defining the eschatological covenant community. In other words, for Paul, Christ faith isn't something which is simply added on to Torah obedience. It rather denies that Torah obedience as normally conceived is of any importance in community definition. But at the same time, this is one of those delightful both ands of Pauline theology, which are so difficult for us to get our minds around, and it means that people like me still have some work to do. Uh, as in Romans 3.31 and other passages, Paul does believe that when someone exhibits that faith in Jesus the Messiah, that person is in fact fulfilling the Torah, even though he or she may neither possess nor observe the written Torah itself. And Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 7, as is well known, something which is mind-blowing and probably uh, designedly funny, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. What matters is keeping God's commandments. Paul knows as well as we do that circumcision was one of God's commandments. He is deliberately saying something so oxymoronic as to provoke uh, reflection on where we are in God's eschatological timetable. And that indeed is the point. Now, so on to point number four. My next point is simply a matter of exploring somewhat further the meaning of the parallel between Qumran and Paul in terms of the meaning of Paul in particular, that Paul's justification language is not about entry but about definition. This, ironically, is something that Ed Sanders in his writings on Paul never got round to seeing. Sanders spent so long in saying that Judaism was not concerned so much with getting in as with staying in, but he still supposed that Paul's justification language was about getting in. I'm suggesting to you that it isn't, and that the parallel between Paul and MMT actually tightens up that argument. For Paul, the language of justification is not about entry but about community definition. The first place where justification is expounded by Paul is Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 following. And there, what is at stake is not how someone gets to be a member of the community, but rather who one is allowed to eat with. Are Jews and Gentiles who both give allegiance to Jesus as Messiah, are they allowed to eat together or do they have to eat at separate tables? That is the 
issue. Faith is not for Paul the thing that you do to earn acceptance with God, as in some parodies of Pauline theology. It is rather a gift from God, it's quite clear in Paul, which forms the badge of membership in what he calls the true family of Abraham. Now, remember how MMT expounded this covenantal scheme in terms of David and Solomon, then Jeroboam, then Zedekiah, then exile. Paul never mentions Jeroboam or Zedekiah, and he only alludes to Solomon obliquely. But he does mention David in exactly the same passage that he's talking about faith being reckoned as righteousness. Romans 4, verses 6 through 8. Very similar to MMT Part C, lines 25 and 26. I haven't got time to develop that uh, any further. Just to note that in Paul, as in Qumran, David is not just a miscellaneous example of someone who does the right thing and God is pleased with him. Rather, Paul sees him as part of an eschatological scheme. Now comes the crunch, and here I am implicitly arguing against the others who have written on this subject before. Is Paul attacking what MMT is commending? And this is going to take us actually through the rest of 4 and then 5 and 6. What is Paul arguing against when he attacks works of the law? Not those who think that religion is about outward observances rather than inward attitudes. That caricature of Paul has become so popular that Paul is still sometimes criticized as though he had anticipated not just Luther, but even the German Enlightenment and Immanuel Kant. Paul is not opposed to outward things in religion for their own sake, nor is he attacking what you might call proto-Pelagianism, the belief that you have to pull yourself up by your moral bootstraps and earn your way to salvation by unaided good works. I have no doubt that if Paul had met any Pelagians walking down the street, he would have hit them pretty hard with the gospel of grace, but we have no reason to suppose that he ever did meet such persons. That's a later problem. But nor, more importantly for the present discussion, is Paul attacking the sort of extra-biblical halakot which feature in most of MMT. Specific and detailed commands concerning animal fetuses, concerning banning the blind and lame from the temple, observing certain purity laws relating to streams of liquid and so on. These go way beyond anything in the Torah itself, and they serve to define one group of Jews over against another group of Jews. Paul, rather, is denying that the basic biblical commands themselves, which were in his day the most obvious defining marks of Israel over against the nations, are of any continuing relevance for defining the true people of God, the people in whom the promises to Abraham and the promises in Deuteronomy have come true at last. We need to note in the same breath, of course, that for Paul, the basis of this critique of the works of the Torah is not that the Torah or its commands were evil or stupid or wrong-headed or demonic. People have often said that Paul thinks that sort of thing about the Torah. He doesn't. Rather, the basis for the critique is eschatological. Torah has done its job. The Messiah has come. The Torah was designed for the period before the time when Deuteronomy 30 would be fulfilled. Now, he says, in the new age which has been ushered in by Jesus' death and resurrection, Torah is relativized. It is by itself of no use for defining who are God's eschatological people. You can see the same thing if you observe that MMT's regulations in sections A and B particularly relate primarily to the Jerusalem temple and its purity. Many think that both the writer and the readers were probably priests, so that makes sense that they would be focused on the temple. That's got very little to do with the issues addressed by Paul. The agitators in Galatia may conceivably have claimed authority from the Jerusalem apostles. Certainly Paul distances himself from Jerusalem and its Christian leadership, but he doesn't mention the temple, nor as far as we know, do his opponents, nor are they concerned with the purity codes that relate to its functioning. Indeed, by calling the Jerusalem apostles so-called pillars, stuloi in Greek, Paul downgrades the physical temple in favor of the newly constituted Christian community. They are the, the pillars of the new community. And that move is unlike anything ever envisaged in MMT. The point remains, Paul is not attacking 
that which MMT is urging. Those scholars who've written about this so far have, I think, jumped too quickly to the conclusion that, aha, here we have the very thing that Paul, Paul is attacking what they were urging. It's not so. So, I think I've now said enough to make it clear under point four, despite all the contentions of previous writing, that Paul is not attacking that which MMT is commending, but something actually bigger. Paul is saying that not just that you've, you can't be defined by this little selection of works of the law, but that no biblical works of Torah, neither possession nor keeping of them, can define the eschatological community. So, fifthly, what then does Paul do with halakha? It has become commonplace in some circles that Paul too has a halakha. Peter Thompson, a great Dutch Pauline scholar of our day, has written a book on Paul's halakha. And uh, Kimron and Strugnall, in their edition of MMT, say, after all, this is very like Paul, because here in MMT we have a list of halakot which says, concerning this matter, concerning that matter, concerning the other matter. And in Paul we know, e.g. 1 Corinthians, that he can write concerning this matter, concerning the other matter, and so on. However, they have actually overstated the case. That parallel only holds for 1 Corinthians, and then only for part of it, it doesn't work anywhere else in Paul, and even in 1 Corinthians, when Paul develops the particular issues that he's saying concerning marriage, concerning food offered to idols, concerning speaking in tongues, his arguments are different in form as well as in content from what we find in MMT at this point. But the key thing to be said here, key thing under point five, is that halakha plays no part in Paul's theology of justification. Paul does not give rulings on contentious issues in order thereby to define the community ethically or ethnically or in any other way. Paul gives these rulings which we might call ethical broadly speaking in order to persuade those who are already defined as members of the eschatological covenant community by their faith in Jesus the Messiah, in Jesus the risen Lord, in order to persuade them that this membership carries with it an obligation and indeed a possibility to behave in a particular way. Paul really does want people in the community to practice a certain kind of ethic rather than other lifestyles and ways of behavior. But this behavior, this halakha, is never ever made a matter of justification. It is inconceivable that Paul would ever say that if people do the things he is urging, that will be reckoned to them as righteousness. He reserves that language, reckoning as righteousness, for faith and faith alone. So to my sixth point where we actually bring the two together and let them knock some sparks off each other a bit further. Granted then that the works of the law which are urged by MMT are not what Paul is opposing, might it still be the case that MMT nevertheless corresponds in outline, in form if not in content, to that which Paul was opposing? Might Paul's opponents have a shape similar to the shape which MMT was offering. Here we must distinguish two issues. Paul's rejection of the position that he had held as a Pharisee and Paul's opposition to those whom he calls the agitators in the letter to Galatia. And each must be considered on its own merits. Again, though MMT is written neither by nor for Pharisees, the shape of its doctrine of justification, which as we've seen was, was covenantal and eschatological, might be thought to be similar to that of the Pharisees. As we've seen, it corresponds closely at a structural level to that which Paul himself expounds as a Christian, and Paul may be thought to have retained the shape of Pharisaic thinking while filling it with new content. Basically, we have no reason to suppose that Paul had had any contact or dealings with Qumran or that he'd ever read MMT or anything like it. Therefore, it's likely that if he has, in his own Christian theology, a doctrine which is similar in shape to that of MMT, it may mean that his pre-Christian Pharisaism had that same shape, though no doubt a different halakha to that of MMT.
The difference between MMT and Pharisaic doctrine, if this is true, would then be at the level not of form or theological structure, but simply of detailed content. MMT would say these particular halakot will define the eschatological people of God, and the Pharisees would say, no, 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 these particular ones will define you as God's true people. Both would have believed in something that Paul would have recognized and rejected as justification by works, the definition of the community of the eschatological Israel in terms of particular halakha, but they would have disagreed with each other on what precisely those works were to be. Now, a caveat must be entered at this point, because we don't know if the Pharisees held a form of inaugurated eschatology corresponding to that which MMT assumes for Qumran. We don't know if the Pharisees of Paul's day believed in any sense in a bit of inaugurated eschatology. We don't have anyone saying that Hillel or Shammai or anyone else had achieved something new comparable to what the Qumran people believed the teacher of righteousness had achieved or still less comparable to what the Christians believed that Jesus the Messiah had achieved. It may be that the Pharisees did believe that adhering to their interpretation of the Torah constituted them already as some kind of a renewed eschatological community, but we can't be sure of that. The fact that Paul the Christian, with his own form of inaugurated eschatology, rejects his former self-understanding doesn't necessarily mean that before his conversion he held a different form of inaugurated eschatology. I hope you don't mind me telling you all these things we can't be sure of. I think it's actually rather important as a New Testament scholar that when we're not sure of something, we should say we're not sure of something. In other discussions and other places, I go around telling people that I am very agnostic about Q, for instance. And that shocks some of my colleagues to the core far more than it would shock them if I said that I was agnostic about anything to do with Jesus. But that, that's a whole other issue. What about the Galatian agitators then? They most likely did believe that Jesus was the Messiah, so to that extent the agitators in Galatia may have believed that the New Age had been inaugurated. Although the prominence that Paul gives to the deliverance for them from the present evil age in Galatians 1.4 may indicate that they hadn't quite got it clear as far as he could see. But it's perfectly possible to suppose that Paul and MMT and the Pharisees and the agitators may have held four quite different positions. We have to be very careful here. But of course what Paul does say about the agitators is that they are only really interested in circumcision and Sabbath and food laws. The things that will mark out this community over against paganism. They want the ex-pagan converts, from their point of view the still pagan converts, uh, to to look like Jews outwardly so that they won't be persecuted. Who is persecuting them and for what reason is a complication which I'm not going to get into this afternoon. We're already, I think, complicated enough for an oral presentation. Rather, the Galatian agitators don't seem to have had any detailed post-biblical halakha in the way that MMT does. Rather, they simply seem to have a selection of biblical works, circumcision, Sabbath, and food laws, as the definition, uh, defining marks of the community from the way they see it. And Paul says, actually, if you go that route, you ought to be keeping the whole biblical law. That's Galatians 5, verse 3. And so uh, it looks as though they too are in quite a different position to MMT as well as to Paul. So to be precise, the problem that Paul meets in Galatia is not that a specific halakha is being taught, to which he objects as might a member of one sectarian Jewish group against another. The fundamental issue is Paul's eschatological claim that Israel's God has now acted in Jesus, demonstrating through the resurrection that he was indeed the Messiah and so declaring that the new age promised in Deuteronomy 30 has actually arrived. And that is, for Paul, the age when Gentiles will be welcomed in with equal status as members of God's people. So for Paul, the true people of God are no longer definable in terms of Torah, which is the peculiar possession of Israel, 
but only in terms of faith. I realize how controversial that last statement is. There are, of course, many writers in our own day who want to say, like Jacob Neusner and others, that Torah was always intended for everybody and that Israel happens to have got it, but it was designed for everybody. From Paul's point of view, it is Israel's possession, and that's one of the reasons why it can't be the badge of the people who now consist of Jews and Gentiles alike. What Paul is objecting to, then, in the attempt by the agitators to define the Christian community is not that they're trying to impose on the converts a particular halakha, a special set of subtopics defining the written Torah more closely, but that they're simply trying to get these ex-pagan Galatians to submit to the most basic and Israel-defining precepts of the written Torah, Sabbath and food laws and circumcision. Now, insofar as some of MMT is designed to make the boundary between Israel and the Gentiles more precise and sharply defined, you can see that MMT and the agitators belong loosely within the same world, though there are all sorts of differences between them. But the main thing is that they are using these extra halakot to define one group of Jews against another, as well as against the Gentiles, and that we have no reason to suppose the agitators had ever even thought of. What MMT adds to the discussion then, apart from a strong reinforcement of a covenantal and eschatological understanding of justification, is the fact that something we can loosely call justification by works of Torah was not just a Pharisaic doctrine, nor simply something that the Galatian agitators were, were urging. It characterized various sorts of sectarian Judaism and perhaps mainstream Judaism as well. Before we had MMT, we weren't really sure just how far we could press that. Now I think we know that it really is there firmly in Qumran as well. So once, how we, once we understand how sectarian Judaism at that period functioned within a prevailing eschatological scheme in which the inaugurated last days were in the process of bringing about the real return from exile, this is not surprising. What is surprising, frankly, is that if it's taken a remarkably long time for MMT to see the published light of day, and that has been the burden of Herschel Shank's song for the last many years, it's taken a lot longer for scholars, even those committed to understanding early Christianity within its Jewish context, to grasp the deeply Jewish, deeply covenantal, deeply eschatological nature of Paul's doctrine of justification, which I hope I have now highlighted. Perhaps those writers who in their own day would have remained implacably opposed to one another may today join forces to reveal both by their mutual incompatibility and by their family resemblance that the history of religions concerns confrontation as well as derivation, critique and innovation from within as well as polemic from without. So to conclude, when all's been said and done in distancing Paul and his controversies from those of MMT, we are left with substantial support for a view which I've argued elsewhere, namely that Paul's discussions of justification are covenantal and eschatological. Please note as a footnote, I was giving a lecture at Princeton a few days ago and talking about similar things to this and somebody said, but I've just been reading Lou Martin and Chris Becker and all these people who say that Paul is apocalyptic and therefore is not covenantal at all. Now, to my mind, that is a totally false either-or. Qumran was totally apocalyptic in the sense that they believed that God's great age-old plan had now been unveiled, apocalypsed, revealed in the events of the founding of the community and would be revealed in the future and that they were the group who had the secret to this. That's apocalyptic if you like. But this apocalyptic still stands within this covenantal context. The radically new thing that God is going to do, and it's that radical newness that people often want to emphasize when they talk about apocalyptic, goes with the long covenant plan. They are not opposed to one another. For Paul, what counted was that the God of Israel had now at last unveiled his covenant plan. Paul's language for this is, of course, apocalyptic. Romans 1.17, Dikaus Unetheu Apocalyptotai. The righteousness of God has been apocalypsed, has been unveiled. The curtain's been drawn back. And the promises were initially fulfilled in the time of David for Paul, but now 
The sequence of promise has run underground through the time of desolation and exile and has emerged into the light again in God's new messianic day. So the comparison between Paul and MMT highlights the way in which Paul's writings on justification belong firmly within their Jewish context. And it highlights the significance of the new thing that Paul was saying precisely within that context. On the one hand, we only understand Paul if we see that he, like MMT, was declaring as a good Second Temple Jew that the eschatological moment had come, that the community of the New Covenant had now been established, that the definition of this community in the present was a matter of the utmost urgency. On the other hand, by contrasting Paul with MMT, we can see the difference it made when the eschatological event consisted not of a new teaching like that of the teacher of righteousness, not of an intensification of Torah, but of the crucifixion and resurrection of Israel's Messiah. Thereafter, no longer could the New Covenant community be defined in terms of a subset of ethnic Israel, marked out by the works of Torah, defined this way and that with the developing halakha. Rather, the New Covenant community, formed through the death and resurrection of the Messiah and the gift of the Spirit, would now be known by what we might call messianic faith. And that meant that the community was open to all comers. Therein lie both the deep Jewishness of Paul and his most radical innovation. Thank you very much for your patience. <clears throat>